if I look like I don't know how to use a computer, I'm not using my regular computer. So. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm just talking about objects and vectors. And these are, thankful, thanks for suggesting this, John, because these are relatively straightforward. I took a look at side effects and was a bit intimidated. So um, these are pretty straightforward and very nicely named. So um, expect equal is, Oh, sorry, I'm gonna start with expect identical. Expect identical is the very strict um, uh, definition of two things must truly be equal um, or ide truly identical in every sense. Um, here is something that's mentioned that I only barely understand, but test that has multiple additions that you can choose to use. Um, I, so uh, all right, for the third edition, apparently both use Waldo. But all right, we'll get to that. So identical, I just went through and took the documentation from the end, right? Whatever they call them, <laughs> examples, there you go. Um, so expect identical. If they're truly identical, it returns nothing. And if there's any anything, even though two and two L look pretty darn similar, they're equal, but not identical. And it tells you that much. So expect equal allows a tolerance. Um, and this tolerance, you can set, it has uh, some default. Um, so when you get into, you know, if you hit identical, but you get into weirdness about how things are stored and rounding, whatever, <laughs> then they're gonna be not identical. Um, it does mention that there are these extra arguments that you can use. It doesn't give any usage on any information on how to use them just says for expert use only. <laughs> um, so I guess you can get into um, situations where you're really not helping inform things. I don't really know why it's considered expert, but, um, and yeah, you can set the tolerance. So the tolerance by default is sufficient so that whatever rounding or storage happens here that returns two different versions of two um, are by default not expected, but if you change that tolerance and you make it much smaller, um, you can return an error of them not of two and two not being the same. Yeah. Um, I, I just yes. want to interrupt that. I think sometimes um, this is for expert use means we only use this in one package, so we're not going to bother documenting all the details about it yet. Um, it, like it isn't necessarily that it's super complicated, I think. Yeah, it seems um, like it just adds <laughs> it here, but I guess. yeah. <laughs> That, that's helpful. So you can look at what the tolerance is. It's a small number. Um, one thing that I found was a little odd is they mention quasi label quite a bit throughout this. Um, <laughs> this is such a basic thing, but I don't understand. So quasi label uh, is something that maybe someone will cover, but I was like, where does this show up? And it's not anywhere here. So it's in the How article about um if you go to the articles tab i can't remember the name of the article but there's one uh, uh and oh custom expectations that's where it was and so i'm pretty sure it's in there yeah so why would a function be in this package and not show up in reference so that's something um on the um the site the um package down site yeah you you can set it up to only show certain things and so they intentionally don't show it because they want you to read about it in the context of the article um but i actually submitted a pr because in the reporting section there is a base function that some of the reports uh reference but it doesn't it doesn't show up in the help and so this would be another case where if you find it confusing you know like i don't know i want to talk to them about don't hide things, you know, just yeah, like save this advanced I, topics I, or something, you know. Yeah. I expect reference to be everything. <laughs> yeah, it's by default, it's everything that you export from the package, but they have intentionally made a choice to group things. And when they group things, if you don't put any, if you don't put something into a group, it doesn't show up. Okay. Um, it's a little, it, like, I can kind of understand it because it is an advanced topic, but, you know, I don't know, maybe it links from the um, article so you could get to it that way. Yeah, I mean, um, they have links everywhere. They yeah. Have it, so I guess that's fine, but I just. 
Yeah. Glad to see it. But most people aren't coming to their help the way we do. So I think that's part of it that they want to only show you the actual use cases, not the weird cases. Um, but yeah, it is okay. interesting that they have like invisible uh, functions. Yeah. And so um, th this is only tangentially related, but Waldo is this package that basically just has this one function compare. There's one <laughs> other function in it. Um, and uh, it is the thing that I have seen it loaded a number of times and always wondered where, what it does and what it comes from. But compare is basically the only function it exports. And it's just the thing that nicely prints what's the difference in two um, objects. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. It first 10 by default differences if they're differences. Um, so that that's what's relied on. The one thing I didn't understand is how to tell uh, um, which version I'm currently using of test that. So you are going to be using, if you're running things interactively, I think by default it uses 3E. Okay. But in a package, it, um, Is that it? Okay. in the description file, it you set it and uh, that's weird. I wanted um, to take an argument, but that's not how it works. Oh. Huh. Um, So uh, it, in the package, there's a setting for it. And by default, if you add tests to a new package, it automatically sets it to use third edition. But they wanted like, you know, a large percentage of CRAN depends on test that. Hmm. So that's why they did this weird addition thing is they wanted to make some fairly major changes to test that, but they would break like every package on CRAN. One way to do that would be to make a package test that too like they did with ggplot to ggplot2. And you know there are a few things that are that way. Um, I'm not sure why they went with the weird addition thing. Um, it probably made the transition easier. Yeah. I don't know. So it actually um, looks like by default, it, it went to two. I mean, I installed Tesla okay. yesterday, so. That's okay, cool. I couldn't remember. That makes okay. sense because if you don't way it doesn't break. explicitly set it, it stays yeah. with the old one, yeah. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is like the output changed and some things like there are automatic systems that depend on the error message being a specific mm -hmm. format. Um, so that's why they, they had to do this fancy thing. And there is a article about that, that we will read at some point I, that yeah. gives you the basics. Okay. Um, All right. So the next three are <laughs> expecting types and S3 and S4 classes. If I really truly understood the difference in classes, that would be, <laughs> maybe be helpful. But um, so this was already new to me, which was, you know, I'm used to hitting class or STR on things, but I hadn't explicitly ever typed type of. Um, so type of is more limited than class, um, which maybe everyone knows the different types that are available in R, but this was uh, news to me. <laughs> um, so it's a just more limited um, thing than I'm used to seeing from living only in class world um and so yeah so here it gives you x they make an x where we've got an integer and a factor but factors are not really factors factors are integers <laughs> yeah. um so is this a data frame yes it's a data frame is it a s4 it's not s4 um and is it a list? And the answer is yes, it's a list because data frames are lists. All right, yeah, it is a list. Yeah, I uh, actually, I was trying to uh, make sure something returned a list the other day and had to use expect type because list isn't an S3 class. It's, it's a type. And so hmm. I was, I, um, I'm used to just uh, using expect S3 class because that's what you use for a lot of things, but the the actual base types, you have to use expect type. So. Okay, yep. <laughs> so it is an integer, this vector. <laughs> it's a vector of integers and- uh, Right, that's it. It is not an S3 object. Oh, right, sorry, because we've already gotten down to the vector level. Um, and 
so this was a factor, which is definitely not a character anymore. So no, nope, it's an integer. Fact is factors are integers. Uh, and it is not a factor. Why is this not a factor? Because you know it is. You got no. it. It says it, it didn't fail on the expect test three class. It just failed on the expect type of character. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Yeah. The whole returning <laughs> nothingness. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so then we can move to Tibbles and help. Um, shouldn't have done that there. Okay. All right. And <laughs> well, this whole thing won't ever like run because there's so many fails, but show failure. So, all right, there's, this is a Tibble. Um, but then this I thought was interesting. So, right, the class of the Tibble is this Tibble DF, Tibble, or data frame. Right. Actually, is this a... This link three. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yes. So you have so if you um, specify exact, then I suppose you have to specify all of these. Yes. Um, which I'm not sure how to do. Is that like C table? Do you have to speed it the vector of all these things? Yes. And so a function that I love that is really useful for this kind of case. And actually, I want to see this because I don't know if the order matters. It does. So you need, yeah. Um, if ah. you do, if you do um, class or, or do D put D, uh, D P U T and then class uh, X tipple. So that. Okay. That gives you the code to regenerate whatever you put in it. So if you put D put X tibble, yeah. It'll show you the structure call that you can use to create that tibble. Um, it's just useful for it really it, like I learned about it for writing tests. Okay. Um, <laughs> because okay. Okay. you so usually I I would still put you don't want to put it there. Okay. You want to put it you want to call it and then use that to decide what to put into the test, and then you, okay. you know you can just copy paste the call. Um, because if you run deep put on um, the thing you're testing, then of course it's going to match. Right, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, so yes, exact makes it very, very strict. Um, what does it say about it? It says uh, checks that it inherits from class if true. Checks that it's identical. All right. So vectors, vectors are pretty straightforward. Okay, we start with length. I, I'll click through to it, but it's pretty, <laughs> just takes two things, the object itself and N. Um, so we've got length one, length 10, and then you get an error. If it's, since it's not two, a nice informative error. Um, then we've got expect less than, less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, which are also nice and, oh, these are all gonna be the same one, uh, which is also nice and stri pretty straightforward, just a value to compare and it's expected bound. So if we have nine, we're expecting nine to be less than 10, great. We're expecting 11 to be less than 10, should fail. It even tells me the difference, that's cool. Um, <laughs> equal to, doesn't, no failure. Um, is 11 great? So we're expecting 11 to be greater than 10, shouldn't fail, good. <laughs> expecting nine to be greater than 10, we get an error and we get the difference again. And greater than or equal to, awesome. So that was nice and very straightforward. And all four <laughs> of them went to the same thing. Um, yeah, just and, a tip. When they have the row, they're all of the same functions, one. Yeah. They're always the same file. Yep. Well, I sort of know that, but um, <laughs> okay. Expect name. We'll get back to this quasi-legal thing. So, 
here we've got x. What does x look like? X is a named vector, and um, we are testing whether the names of it correspond to that vector, and we get great. You can also um, test if something doesn't have names by just um, putting null as the second argument, which doesn't work. So there are also two other, yeah, um, arguments you can feed it, which is about order and case. So um, here they don't match at all, but you can say ignore order and they get closer to matching. It gives you the error back in the same order. Um, and then if you say also ignore case, then you actually, it actually comes back um, with no error. And then you can see if you have an unnamed vector, unnamed whatever, and yeah. All right, so this one is fun, the set equal and map equal. So this is just considering two sets and test that the sets are equal in like set equality world. So just that every element in one is in the other order as having no relevance. And um, I'll start with that one. So letters by default is just all 26 letters. You can reverse them. So if we just say our letters and reverse letters the same, it won't give us, it'll not fail. Um, but if we take uh, A away, yeah, so we can see that, yeah, A was not in reverse letters. So it gets very helpful error messages, I'm very impressed. Um, so map equal is taking that to another, one more level of like, is every named list? So for named things, do the things and the things they map to, um, are they in both in uh, your object and your expected object? So this is what you would use to work on with lists, named lists. I can't. I don't know of any other instance where you'd use it. So you get an expect map equal no errors return. Um, if you remove one object from the list, we should get an error. Um, and it just tells you that the named element is missing. We were expecting a B and we don't have a B. Um, if you give it, here we have a, they're not the same values, but they are the same names. And that's what it tells me that um, the value itself is not, is not the same. Um, right, so this is technical, this is what it says it's testing for, right? Names of Y. So I just needed to remind myself that X names of Y gives me exactly back next. Um, all right, so show failure. This is just a different way of having yet another failure of, uh, here we've got both A and B, but B is what's supposed to be, is, is one in X. And these are definitely not the same. Uh, multiple things are wrong. And here we've added our expected value has a third element than our given value. And so in our object, we do not have C. It gives us a nice error message. And then we get down to the, I should have looked at side effects because this is going way too fast. Um, <laughs> expect true and false are super duper simple. And they don't recommend generally using these um, because they're less informative, but they're uh, pretty robust, I guess. <laughs> And they behave exactly as you would think. So they gave lots of different ways of saying to and not to. Um, they give you exactly what you would expect. So uh, yeah, not return anything. Um, but here's their example of saying like, yes, you can say here is length a three, but you should actually just use the expect equal, um, which is what we started with to explicitly do that rather than expect true. 
it's their preference. And then the last one is, um, does it return a vector? I had not heard this word prototype before. In English, yes, but not in R. <laughs> um, and it is, you know, what the vector is composed of. Um, I, yeah, I didn't know that, that word there. So you can specify either the, you can specify both the, apparently the prototype, the type of the vector and the size or either. Um, and it seems like if you specify both, it only reports the failure for, um, if both fail, it, it stops at first failure, which is the, the prototype. So here we have a integer vector from one to 10. So yay, it passes. If we just give it integer, that's fine. If we just ask if it's 10, that's fine. Um, if we give it the wrong size, if we have mismatch in size expectation versus the object, we get a failure. If we have mismatch between the expected type prototype and the object we give it, we get a failure. And if we have mismatch between the expected size and the expected prototype, we get a failure, but they only tell us about the first. I'm curious, you're, you're in addition two right now, right? Yes, okay. I should so try if you it. switch to three, I'm curious if it shows you more information about that. Okay. Uh, set Let's edition? See. How did I do that? The local edition, I think. And it, yeah, it'll run it when the session ends or when you tell it to end. So. Uh, ah, still. Nope. Okay. It's the same. So. What was the get edition thing um i don't remember edition get okay okay yeah okay. i was just curious if that was part of what they did with the fancier messaging but no very cool sorry that was just half an hour that was it <laughs> thanks for giving me a straightforward one I've got, I've got actually a, a question to bring us back to Yay. the beginning if that's okay um uh, on, I actually worked out the answer for myself uh, um, in parallel, but still I'll, I'll ask the question in case others have more knowledge. Um, for the expect identical, um, it, it, it talks about objects and it's grouped under the kind of like the objects heading. So I was wondering, like, does it work for any kind of R object you throw at it? I mean, I guess maybe the, the extent to which the reporting is informative and useful may vary, but I actually just kind of did a simple thing where I took two data frames and compared them and, and uh, detected differences and said something about where the differences lie. But I'm wondering if you could do it with a con complex list objects. I was thinking, for example, uh, uh, like G GT tables, for example, or ggplot uh, uh, objects, you know, if you could somehow identify differences uh there i guess you'd have to have like test fixtures to to set up that but yeah i'll stop there i'm trying so i think um i think the more or with really complex things you're going to run into places where it doesn't work um i'm trying to find if i can get a really good example that they talk about like snapshots will go into that a little bit um because there are cases where like just saying they're all identical doesn't really tell you enough. Um, sorry, I'm trying to like type and talk. Um, I think there are limits, but I think a complex list would be fine. Um, ggplot objects are their own special uh, object oriented um, object. I don't know that that would work. I don't remember if like models will work, but I think most models are just lists under the hood. And so let's see. Yeah. Or type of. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right. So probably that my guess is that'll work. I'm used to doing identical. Um, when I'm 
I don't know, it's not useful that often, but occasionally, uh, but expect identical. So, yeah, okay. That's not the same as knowing that it would fail if something was wrong. Right. Somewhere down the line. Um, what can I? So I'm trying to find. Um, yeah, so I mean, it found that pretty darn quickly. Yeah. And and yeah, and like it shows you where it fails. Um, I would not, so I would say in general, um, testing ggplot is tricky and you need to be really careful about it. And they have a whole article in, I think they have an article in ggplot about writing tests. Um, let's see, extending, um, yeah, using in packages probably. Um, I don't know, we need, um, June here <laughs> the, uh, to tell us all about the internals of ggplot. Yeah, so um, there's a package vdiffer that they recommend for testing ggplot output. Um, let me throw this into the chat. Oops, if I can open the right window. What so was it called? That vdiffr. Um, yep, that's not our chat. And there. And I open the chat again, or I put the reference in the chat. So um, it's like it exists specifically for comparing ggplot2. Um, because it's comparing uh, the visual components because there can be things that aren't quite exactly the same but they still are the same or, or under the hood it can be the same i think there are some things that the order can change oh that's part of it that um the internal representation can change without the output changing and so they don't want you to compare the actual internal. object because then if they break or if they change something in ggplot your test will fail, which makes them not able to put that onto CRAN if your package is on CRAN. And so they have instructions on, you know, if you're writing a package that's going to be on CRAN, please don't be over strict on how you're comparing your plots because it ties our hands on how to test things. So, um, so there are things that are specific for things like that. Um, like I know Torch uses its own object oriented. Uh, well, it, it just R6 in general, if you have uh, R6 objects, they kind of exist outside of R. They're, they exist as pointers and that can break tests. So there are special cases where expect identical can give you a failure, even though the objects are effectively identical. Um, And then there are, I guess there would be cases where, I, uh, no, that would be, um, so expect identical might tell you, oh no, this object is different than the one that you have saved, but it visually is the same. And so it should pass is the idea. Um, Got it. <laughs> yeah, so not, so, not, so not surprisingly, I guess, as you get to kind of like, uh, maybe not edge cases, but like particular areas you may have, you may need to, to rely on other tools to uh, perform tests on those kind of complex objects, or at least objects where you want to kind of detect changes in particular attributes of that object. Right. Yeah. Um, like when we get into snap dot, snapshot testing, um, which I think we'll, I guess next week we will do, there's a lot there of um, it's kind of the easiest forms of tests to write, but you have to be careful because it is testing like exactly the object, like how the object prints. 
um, it's not exactly, the, you know, like it's not the list behind the object, but it's how the object prints. And there can be little differences that it would, um, that would cause it to fail. And so you got it, you know, it's the same thing where it's the easy way to check, but actually like there are, there have been things where my test pass, but then um, I change something that should break the test and the test still passes because the snapshot is like looking at it weird. Anyway, we'll talk about that next week. It'll make more sense. Um, one thing that I wanted to go ahead and pull up. Wait, can so we, before that, we go on, oh, I'm confused about yeah. this one example they have. So what's going on here? So, I mean, I took it out of that test that function. The So this is a plot, right? Okay. Yay, plot. Okay. What is this? This is the name of the What is this? Uh the title. Oh, this is the title of the test. What is the test unit two though? Right. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, this is, it's snapshot testing. We will talk about this next week. Okay. <laughs> um, snapshots, the first time you run the test, it saves a thing. So it's okay. assuming that it's correct that first time you run it. Okay. And then the next time you run the test, it loads that thing that it saved and makes sure that you still have the same thing. Now, in this case, they're, they're kind of, they're saving a representation of the plot, not the exact details of the plot, I assume. Um, but snapshot testing is very nice. It makes things really uh, straightforward. Um, all right, so the thing I wanna try to do, and we'll see how this works out, is let's go ahead. There are these set things at the very bottom of the help, the expectation internals. There's this function expect, and then there's a pair of functions fail and succeed. Let me put those in. Um, in chat. So in expect, this is just, this is what all the expect that, uh, or all the other expect functions are based on. Um, so yeah, if we go to expect and then we'll go to fail. So we can see that this is just saying, um, We have, uh, they call that like at the end of their tests. And we'll talk about this more when we talk about the vignette, but just to kind of get the baseline on this so we can check it off. Um, there's, so expect is you tell it if it's true or false, you give it a specific failure message and give it some more um, information. And like, you know, they've got these like, don't use info. Um, Uh, source ref is if you have something that is saved somewhere, you, have, you can use that to send it in. Um, the trace would be the error that you caught somewhere else that you can give it into this. And then the trace env is the environment um, where the trace like ran. Um, again, we'll see details on this when we read the vignette. But just to to understand that there is this function that they have inside of all of their functions, and that's all that this is really talking about. And then it returns the expectation object that can fail without failing, basically. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. What did you just say? What did that mean? So um, when you run all the test that tests in uh, in uh, uh, you know in a package. Mm -hmm. The expectations don't throw an error. They tell you that an error was thrown. Okay. And that way it will still run the next line um, unless it's an error that's, that's unexpected. Um, and that's but if you're, specific to sorry. package testing, to the way you call it for package testing? It's specific to the way, um, or sorry, yes, because they do throw an error if they're not true. So it's the opposite of that. Um, so uh, sorry, I said that wrong, basically. But they that they throw an error when they're not true, and they throw a structured error that test that can use 
to decide to, you know, how to display things. And so they, um, versus they return nothing when there's not an error. Um, so yeah, this is the function that's like behind all of that. Uh, like I said, there is a whole vignette that's about this. So we'll talk about the, pack, the function in detail in uh, the custom expectations vignette, um, which we'll do that probably towards the end because it's uh, a very weird thing. <laughs> Okay. Um, and then there's, uh, right. So, um, there's just these two functions fail and succeed that, uh, they're there basically. So you can just throw in, um, like, you know, test that this thing works and then you just give it the fail as the, the test. And the reason for that would be, I haven't actually written it yet. I'm not sure what to expect. I just want to have a test there um, so that uh, I know what I'm working on basically. And this is one of those where I didn't know this function exists existed. I will often just throw a stop into code like at the end of the day when I'm working on something so I can remember what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So that if, if I just run my tests, it'll get to that stop and fail, but fail is better because it'll fail like in the format of a test and you'll put it in the testing block and I don't have to be com completely confused by it. Um, and so you can tell it uh, what to say. And, and the idea here is you can just put in a message that is saying, um, I haven't finished writing these tests is kind of the idea. Uh, and that way, um, you know, your tests tell you where you're working. The other way, the other side of that is you can do succeed if um, you want to put in a test block, uh, but you don't want it to um, gum up your errors. I honestly, I'm not sure when I would use succeed. Oh, actually, I do have a case, and actually, I might have to use this um, when I <laughs> when I create packages. You know, I wrote my end this package that does the whole. Uh, setting up all the things that I like. And one of the things that it sets up is uh, test that. It automatically puts uh, sets up test that, but the um, GitHub actions fail the first time they run because there aren't any tests. And so I might start throwing in a dummy test that succeeds just so my GitHub actions won't fail. Um, and then once I have real tests, I can delete that dummy test. That that would be the only reason that I can imagine using this. So basically um, for like a side effect in a certain sense, right? Yeah. But yeah, fail, I get. Like I, I do something like that and I'm going to start using this, I think, because it's cleaner. Um, but succeed is just if you want to have the test there, but the test won't actually test anything. <laughs> like it will never it'll just throw a success. Um, I, yeah, I don't have an exact reason for that one. John, do you know what these uh, fail and succeed things might do to your, kind of like your test coverage? Would it kind of arbitrarily inflate your test coverage, let's it say? It shouldn't change anything because test coverage is actually looking at what code gets executed during your okay. tests. Um, so yeah, it shouldn't have any impact on that. It will change your, like, if you look at when you run test that, it'll give you like a score of nine out of 10 test pass. And if you have succeed, you could say, you know, uh, 10 out of 11 test pass or however many succeeds you put in. Um, so you could inflate that number, but it doesn't really, you know, that doesn't really do anything anyway. But yeah, I think I, I think the one use case I have for succeed is just to throw in one passing test at the very beginning of a package, so things, uh, so CI doesn't get mad. Although I think a failing test would work just as well, <laughs> so I need to experiment with that. And a failing test, you know, I can put in there the message, write tests, something like that. There are no actual tests for this package. Um, 
I really like fail. I think I'm going to start using this yeah. as sort of a, a placeholder for spots where I know I need to write tests, but for whatever reason, you know, don't have time, energy. Yes. The, mind, the mindset to figure out how to write the tests, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I really, uh, I, a long time ago, I, someone gave me the tip of writing an error message uh, wherever you're working. So I, I will still do that sometimes like within the code that I'm working on, just throw in stop and then uh, a sentence describing what I'm trying to do, but I haven't finished. And that way I don't lose track of what I was doing. If I call the function the next day, it'll throw an error telling me what I was doing. Um, but for tests, fail is a better version of that because it'll put it into the test that um, output. So. For the less um, strict thing, I really like the to do R package. Have you seen it? I, um, it's familiar. I think I had looked at it. They make markers, uh, um, which I don't know. I didn't know. This oh, package. yeah. Package. Okay. I, I have to come across it actually once, but I think only thing I've picked up from that is, you know, making sure I always write my to do's when I know <laughs> there is more to this function. <laughs> I, I don't think I use it the way that, that package really is supposed to be, but I, I just ensure adding my to do so that I can always go back to it. That that is a a great example. I do know um, which you can see over in the outline that um, our studio picks it up, picks up the word Sorry. to do. That was because uh, I did a. That was because yeah, I did a. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's not there. It does it somewhere. Like our studio has a built in. Oh, it really? just that's what it is. It just highlights the word to do. See how yeah. it's a different color. That's all it is. Yeah. I was trying that's to remember. Exactly because it is this package that tells you. But yes. Oh, interesting. That's great. And you can specify to do's versus bugs versus something. Like it has a few different yeah, things. Yeah, it has a bunch of list really items cool. that you can yeah. add to it. I, I love just like that's... I've got a couple of different oh. places where I just can't figure it out. Just. I'm going to add that right. to my art profile. Exactly. Then when you're working on something and, you know, some of the things are working and there is this minor bug, then you're like, oh, I don't know why the state is not, you know, working properly. So like you want to move on and not get stuck at that. So just yeah. write this down and move on. You can come back to this later. So that, you know, in those situations, it really helps. Yeah. Fix me to do the default names. It looks for fix me to do change review and you can do them inside or you can inside code blocks or you can do HTML blocks in the um, in your text. So, but yeah, yeah, I love it for just like, eh, I'm gonna, the, these data I know need to be fixed at some point, but uh, you know. Rebecca, does, it, does this have any visibility like outside of, let's say the, the, the script that you have open? Um, yes, you can specify it to look for multiple scripts. Um, you can, so I just by default, oops, I just by default called it on like this, but you could do it over a whole to do file, to do package. Oh, wow. That's cool. Anyway, I just use it for like add 2022 20, data when it's available or something. <laughs> so, or, you know, yeah. for, for the, the theme of this, uh, this group, I am adding a thing to my our profile, as soon as I play around with this package a little bit to make sure that will call this when I load a new, when I start a new R session, which means if I open a new or open a project that I have been working on, for example, you'll call to do R and tell me what do I have to do in this, uh, this project that I opened. I think- Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think that'll be great. I'll, I'll test it out. I have had things okay. that, you when I see. restart the R session, it'll run it and that can be annoying, but I'm going to look into that because I think this could be really cool as a way to kind of remember what the heck was I doing. There's your HTML. Yeah, I love yeah. it for, because yeah, I'll, I'll stick something in my code about where I'm done, but I love being able to just stick two or three things of like, these are alpha things that definitely need to be fixed. <laughs> Yeah, and for anyone not working or not wedded to, to our studio, uh, there are a couple of nice Visual Studio Code extensions that kind of accomplish the same. And we'll show you like to-dos, uh, 
either is like special, specially render, rendered within your script, or uh, I think I've also seen one not installed, not used, but seen one that shows it in the like file tree. So you can have like a file tree view of to do's. Oh, wow. Which is okay. kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, darn it. You can't put it in your. Um, that's profile? too bad. You can't put it in our profile because it will run before our studio starts and then it doesn't work. Okay. So I, I tried it just now and it, that's too bad. Right. I wonder, oh, wait, 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 I have an idea. Um, uh, let's see. Um, can, can you, do, can you uh, run uh, any file? Can you run a file by default when in uh, by our, pro, I mean, by setting that in our profile? Then you can create your todo.r and then run it as the session loads and then that can have that exact only that statement of to do our colon colon to do our. Um, I think this worked. So uh, I don't know where to put this right away, but um, this is to do test to do our. All right, if I restart my session, Will it do that? No. Okay. I don't have this quite yet, but my right. idea is. Well, I can share my R profile because this is yeah. our studio cloud, so there's nothing that's here. Okay. Um, so my, my thought is we can't run it when our profile runs because uh, our profile runs before our studio loads. But maybe we could do something like on exit run to do R because then it'll oh. only do it after your R profile finishes. So far that hasn't worked, but I'm along those lines, I think this might work. All right. Um, but I need to find, so to do R, Perhaps and that maybe have an RStudio add-in that uh, just invokes it, but then you have to remember to use said add-in. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. No. Let's see if I do that. So far, no luck, but we'll, we'll right. get there. I'm sure there are other ways to solve this problem, but I, like so I had a similar, it. yeah. I, I mean, it's just, it's mostly being silly, but. Um, yeah, it's not working. Um, I had one that would, uh, what is the name of it? There's a um, time tracking website. Um, uh, Poggle? Occupy or something. What do you say, Arthur? Toggle? Yes, toggle. So there's a toggle package that's it's on GitHub for R. And I, I wrote a whole thing that in my R profile, it would um, like look at the working directory and start toggle for whatever I was working on. Um, that one mostly worked, except if you have two R Studio sessions open, it would confuse it. Um, so that part didn't work out as well as I wanted, but I almost got there. And I feel like this to do R thing is pretty close to the same thing where it's gonna, like 90% work, but therefore I won't be able to use it because 90% yeah. isn't enough. Yeah. Um, I've never seen markers before this package, though. I don't know I've if they show up other places them, very often. Um, there is a package called Good Practice. <gasps> which, really? That's a great <laughs> thing. It's for, um, it's for like package development. It'll tell you all these different, it'll, it does a bunch of checks. And it puts in markers of, you don't have tests for this line of code, or which is, that's from actually, so the cover package does that marker. Um, but it does a whole bunch of different things. So say this line of code is too long and it's hard to read or um, oh my gosh. different things like that. Cool. So uh, yeah, it's, it's funny because uh, Hannah Frick went to work for our studio last year or the mm -hmm. year before and um so they had to like 
leave this package behind at their old job and then no one was maintaining it. There was a whole thing, but finally it is up to date and it's working and it, I, I like it a lot. Um, it is something kind of outside of the uh, posit framework that actually I think I have on the list for us to cover eventually in this uh, club. So, um, okay. anyway, so yeah, uh, so yeah, that, that covers uh, expect, fail, and succeed. So now we can knock those ones off the list and we'll do the vignette separately still, but the individual functions, um, I think that covered it well enough. I thank you very much for to do R because I am definitely going to use that even if I can't just automatically do it when I start my session. Um, and then, oh, I had just had that open and I forgot to look that next week. Um, yeah, we don't have anyone signed up next week. So uh, if someone would like to cover snapshot testing, that would be excellent. Um, if not, I can always do it, but uh, it's, you know, it's better if someone else does, because that's the best way to learn the material is to force yourself to go read the docs. Um, I will share the link in the chat so that we can, oops. Uh, so if anyone is thinking maybe I want to do it, but I can't remember where the spreadsheet is, there it is. And it's also linked in the channel. Um, other than that, uh, we ended up managing to take up the whole time. So excellent. <laughs> I will see everyone next week. Thanks. All right. Thank Thanks you very so much. much. Yeah, that was great.